They can't fly yet. But they can't stay cramped up here either. They understand it's time to jump into a brave new world. sister, the most secretive, returns with four cubs, all males. They're a week or two younger than the twins. Three are full of confidence, but one holds back. He might have been called the runt of the litter in the past, but he's probably just a more tentative character. Each lioness has four teats. Nevertheless, the new cubs are keen to suckle with their older cousins. For the original confident female twin, it's an inconvenience. But for her brother, a lone male, it's salvation. Four new males, cousins. If all survive, they could form a powerful coalition. And he's the eldest, potentially the leader. Lions share suckling duty, called allosuckling. It forges bonds between litters and is the foundation for future prides. First lesson of the day is Boyo, or fruit time. Orangutans naturally spend up to six hours a day foraging for food. So breakfast doubles as a perfect learning opportunity. This morning's lesson is in coconut cracking. Orangutans learn from example, so their caregiver shows them how it's done. Mumut, a little male, catches on immediately, while Valentino has a more interpretive approach. With his distinctive pale belly stripe, Valentino is the class clown of Forest School Group 1. What he lacks in technique, he makes up for in exuberance. But when the puzzle proves too hard to crack, Valentino does exactly what he would do if he was in the wild. Asks mum for help. Valentino was found alone in a forest as a baby after his mum was killed. Babysitter Letta is currently his foster mother and she knows Valentino must learn to do this on his own if he's to ever graduate from jungle school. Nearby, the students of Forest Group 2 are incrementally more skillful. It's not so much age that divides Groups 1 and 2, but ability. Little Meryl has learned how to husk her coconut so she can enjoy the sweet milk. But not for long. Opportunistic Valentino moves in to share. He may not be the best at coconut cracking, but learning how to reap the rewards of others' hard work could be an excellent survival skill. Mm -hmm. 
three-year-old Benny has a more laid-back approach. He's exercising his jaws as his powerful teeth scrape the coconut shell. But there's not a lot of other energy being exerted. He doesn't even flinch as Meryl helps herself to his leftovers. Little does Benny know that his expanding girth hasn't gone unnoticed. And he's about to be put on a diet. Wonky Tusk is now the matriarch of a family of five. Her sister, a daughter, a teenage son, and this newly born calf. Elephants with babies are known to be aggressive, but Wonky Tusk seems totally relaxed and undisturbed by Nathan's presence. Ozzy, the barman at the Mufuwe Lodge, witnessed the birth and gave the baby a name. He calls him Wellington. I saw Wellington being born by the, this lagoon you're seeing here. So uh, it's one of the, the elephants which I'm, so far, as long as I'm going to be here, it's the elephant which I'm closely monitoring. Within hours he can walk, but that is about all he can do. Everything else he has to learn from scratch. For the next 14 to 16 years, Wellington will remain with his family. He is totally dependent on their care and instruction for his survival. Few animals form such close and lasting family bonds. They stick together. They care for each other. The family spends about 16 hours a day feeding. In between, there's time to play. Wellington is quick to pick up the important postures in elephant society. He's playing with an older cousin who puffs himself up to look even bigger. But Wellington doesn't fall for the trick. This game is a practice run for the day when these two will have to fight for dominance and the right to mate. Despite his size, Wellington has the upper hand. And the cousin runs back to mommy for protection. Wellington doesn't give up. He drops his head and lowers his trunk. Adults also assume this posture when they get aggressive. Flapping ears and a stiff tail spell danger. He might know all the right moves, but he's still awkward and clumsy. He has a lot to learn. Inside the clinic, a mysterious new arrival waits. Veterinarians Argus and Marios need to assess the new orphan. It's a baby sun bear. The smallest species of all bears. And the only one adapted to the jungles of Southeast Asia. Affectionately named Denny Bear, he was found by local villagers trapped in his flooded ground nest. There was no sign of his mother, so the villagers chose to save him from drowning and brought him to a safe life in captivity. 
At just two months old, the healthy little bear has an impressive set of climbing claws. This isn't the vet's first sun bear. In addition to hundreds of orangutans, the Borneo Orangutan Survival Foundation also has a temporary sun bear sanctuary at Niaru Menteng. It's home to 16 adult and adolescent sun bears that have nowhere else to go. With resources at Niaru Menteng stretched thin, these bears present a dilemma to the staff. But they'll stay here for now while a better future for them is planned. Delhi bears too small to join the older bears just yet. He'll need to be fed every few hours for the next two months. So he'll stay at the clinic for now, where the staff can nurture him. This place is harsh. The winds can blow 60 miles an hour and temperatures can drop down to 50 below zero. Blizzards are unpredictable, and in a matter of minutes, you can be lost in a complete whiteout. Not the best conditions to have three kittens. Most of the animals in this part of the country have evolved to sync the birth of their young with warmer weather and spring conditions. While the winter setting might seem like a death sentence for these little kittens, it's really the opposite. The frigid cold actually drives the prey from the high country down into the valley below. It's like having a buffet right at her front door. It was obvious she had several denning areas and caves that she would go to, but then it was really apparent that there was this one cave, this one cave I call the Kitty Condo. That's kind of her main cave. That's really her home base. I've gone years and traveled thousands of miles looking for mountain lions, and I've barely ever seen one. Finding that cave was huge. I mean, it gave me such an incredible opportunity to set up cameras and film them up close without being intrusive. When I set up on the kills, I really never know what I'm going to get. I just hope everything's going to work. And that's the boy there. Look at him. It's given me a glimpse into the life of a mountain lion family, which is rarely ever filmed. And I'm developing an understanding of an animal that is much more than a predator. There's also this soft side to them where they're, they're just a mother taking care of their babies. This is the little moments that I love. Sitting here at their dinner table allows me to see each of their personalities really come through. Like a good mother, Mama Mo keeps the family clean and fed, and even looks after herself a little bit. Eni is a miniature version of Mama Mo, independent, adventurous, full of courage. And Miney sticks closer to Mom, possessive of Mama Mo's attention. He's the biggest and only male of the kittens, but a complete mama's boy. Amini's name continues to fit perfectly. For a mother to provide food, it's very important. But here's the other thing that this mother provides. Snuggling, loving, cleaning. You just don't, when you think about a mountain lion, you don't think about this side of their life, and this is what they're doing most of the time. <laughs> so it's... She's a new mother.
with a hungry baby waiting to suckle. Her baby, called a hoglet, is just a few days old. It was born blind and helpless. Its spines are soft and hair-like at first. They only start to harden after a week or two. The hoglet will nurse for about six weeks before going off on its own. At about 10 weeks, it'll undergo a process called quilling, losing its baby quills and growing adult ones like its mom. Wellington's curiosity puts Nathan in a tight spot. The overprotective ant flaps her ears. This is a clear sign that Nathan is trespassing. In the lodge, personal space shrinks. Out here it expands. Either way, it is a negotiation. Wonky Tusk will not hesitate to flatten Nathan or any human that comes between her and her calf. Nathan is fully aware that not even the vehicle can protect him if Wonky Tusk decides to charge. One day, something happens that takes Nathan by surprise. Wellington comes charging over, ears flapping. It's remarkable. Wonky Tusk and the rest of the family do nothing to curb his curiosity. For Nathan, this is a clear indication that elephants learn to fear us. It's not in their nature. In the villages across the river, elephants run away from humans. But Wellington's interaction with Nathan and the people at the lodge has only been peaceful. Nathan is smitten. You do get quite attached to them, uh, which you're not meant to. Uh, well, you try not to, but you know, it's hard not to, because, I mean, he's just a you know, very, very cute little character. At the new baby house, where the youngest orphans now live, Everyone seems enthusiastic about the different morning routine. But once the doors open, the bravado vanishes. And many of the nursery babies cling to each other for comfort, as they're still getting used to their new home. This morning, Jellapat's missing his usual hug buddy, Telecan. So he's brought his security blanket along. Everyone rides the wheelbarrow buses for another day in the forest. Two miles away, at the main Niaru Menteng compound, the older classes are already filing into the forest for the day's lessons. Hanin holds up her classmates for a bathroom break. Orangutan style. Chinta deals with the roadblock with her signature move. The group two students pile onto their platform as babysitter Letta constructs one of the famous fruit kebabs the team uses to encourage the students to forage in the trees. Class clown Valentino has a love-hate relationship with this lesson. 
over the past few months, trying to grab moving fruit has frustrated him enormously. He makes a token effort today. But Valentino has no patience for this. And so he goes straight to the source. A dozen wood ducks are ready to hatch. All the chicks are born alert and with a full coat of down. They can't fly yet, but they can't stay cramped up here either. After only one day, mom calls for them to boldly go where they've never gone before. Even at this young age, they understand it's time to jump into a brave new world. It's a 30-foot leap of faith. The first brave soul prepares for liftoff. One down. And its brothers and sisters wait in the wings. Typically, all the chicks will jump just minutes apart. But every now and then, there's a failure to launch. Houston, we have a problem. The eagle has landed. 